Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to our second uh, Tet Dialogue this year, uh, which all have, I think, as you know, the overall aim of um, helping to create a better environment for young, the future generations. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this evening's um, conversation, because there's as much as conversation and learning from each other, as well as having some great speakers here. Um, but alongside uh, the webinars, for those who don't know, we believe it's really important to recognize um, those who are actually um, doing the actual work. So the valuable projects and, in, and that are being taken on uh, right across the country. And we actually recognize this work through our two awards. So it's Inspire Future Generation Awards and our Architecture into Education Awards. So these are for an organization or individuals. Um, but for now, we need to go come back to uh, tonight. Um, and I'm delighted that Joe has uh, agreed to um, chair today. Uh, Joe, I've known for a, quite a few, a few years now, not a lot, um, from the Northwest and um, does fantastic work within her area, but uh, she'll be able to explain that a bit more, but also was a finalist for our Inspire Future Generation Awards in 2021. So Joe, thanks very much and thanks everyone, the speakers, and I look forward to, as usual, a fascinating and uh, enlightening conversation. Thank you, Victoria. Um much appreciate the invite to chair today um, alongside the fantastic contributors that we've got. So we've got three um, contributors, uh, Susanna Walker, who's the co-founder of Make Space for Girls, uh, Maria Vasilaku, urban strategist and advisor on urban transformation, and Shanks Raj, who's the head of Learn Design West, will hopefully be joining us as well just before the end of the, the event. Uh, just to let everyone know, the event's been recorded for public distribution and it's going to be on YouTube within a few days as well. So you'll be able to share with others as well, but just in, in awareness that it is being recorded. Um, and then today we're going to be hearing from um, our speakers and then there'll be an opportunity for questions as well so you can pop any questions in the q a and we'll try and get to as many of them as possible um so we've got 60 minutes we're going to be exploring what good practice looks like in understanding what young people need in the design of public realm and to be able to feel confident exploring their cities and their towns with confidence um, and we're also going to be looking at what what is the opportunities and how can we bring views into the decision making process which I'm personally very very passionate about doing. So our three panellists today are delivering some really innovative and quality programmes that will help to shape the way in which young people are looking at public space, how they create space and how we can create spaces with them and how we can influence the sector and how, how the professionals in the sector are designing both UK, in the UK, sorry, and internationally. So we're all going to hear from those. They're going to share their experiences, what's gone well, um, what, what difference they've made and the lessons that have been learned along the way. And I know my colleague attended a Make Space for Girls talk last week and she came away very inspired. So I'm very looking forward to that and Maria's international perspective. Um, and I'm hoping to learn from both of them. Or I know I'll learn from both. So before I hand over, I've just been invited to give a brief introduction of, of myself and the work that we do at Placed. So um, I've been working in built environment education for about 14 years now. Um, so I used to be at the Northwest Architecture Centre and then set up placed in 2011. And for many years, our focus was very much on delivering activity for young people that developed transferable skills, knowledge and increasing awareness of careers in the sector. So really supporting young people to any, from diverse backgrounds who are underrepresented into the sector. Uh, through creative activities um, based on the built environment. What I would say in relation to, to what we're talking about today is over the last five years, we've increasingly seen a blurring of the boundaries between our education strand and our, our work with young people. And then our work under our broader engagement strand, um, which is focused on live projects and, and shaping decisions through that. And um, our... For one example, which I'll just talk about, is our Placed Academy, which was launched in 2019. And that's our flagship education programme. It's 14 to 18 year olds from the Northwest uh, who are interested in design and the built environments, but not quite sure of the route or the pathway or the opportunities out there. 
And I think the academy, particularly in the most recent year, the one that we're currently delivering, is a perfect example of the shift towards youth voice and empowerment. Um, the academy is a 10 month programme. It's free to access thanks to sponsors. And it sees young people participate in STEM workshops and skill sessions and the summer school. And then an opportunity to, to progress onto the academy alumni um, for further additional support and mentoring and work experience. And through the Academy, um, we've got partners, outreach partners and guard sponsors who have the option to work with our young people, um, which is typically around 40 young people, uh, to gain insight into live projects through structured design workshops. We work with really carefully with those with those partners and sponsors to, to create, to enable young people to really input into some of the issues that they're looking at on, on projects. So in the current programme, our group will be working on seven live projects and reporting directly back to the clients, which includes Liverpool City Region, Metro Mayor, Steve Rotherham. So really having that direct interaction with live clients. Um, the projects range from spatial development strategies to the design of youth council and services and, and urban parks. And the process not only allows sponsors, um, which could be design teams or local authorities to gain invaluable insight, but also empowers the group and means that they know that their views matter and that they're being heard at the same time of developing their skills and working alongside professionals from the sector. And I think fundamentally, given the, st the structure, the support and the confidence to explore and express their views, young people provide an amazing insight and perspective on the challenges and opportunities in our places and spaces. They quite often have a difference and a more localised and intimate experience of neighbourhoods because of how they get around and how what kind of experiences they tend to pursue. And they where they, they highlight those challenges that we might not otherwise be sensitive to or have on our on our consciousness, our radar. Um, and I think the process, it really helps to position some of the, the issues that young people feel are a priority, um, which might not be quite aligned with the wider public. So, for example, um, as part of the Academy, we've delivered the summer programmes for um, Liverpool City Region for three years, who've been the partner um, looking at spatial development strategy. And young people have consistently raised sustainability and climate change as the priority. And that's directly influenced the policies being made by Liverpool City Region, who've now placed a much greater emphasis on tackling these issues and building them into every single policy. And it's it's interesting how many of those we work with, both on the Academy and our wider engagements, are surprised at just how valuable that process of working with young people are. I think also young people and the insights they give us, there's often many parallels with other demographics, so old people uh, or those with less disposable income. So feelings of safety, a need for spaces they can belong and access opportunities without prohibitive costs, a desire for places that are sustainable and climate resilient, and gender sensitive solutions, which I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about in a moment as well, as some of the priorities that we hear frequently. And I think and more generally, I suppose, to, to finish for me, um, for young voices to be heard, there's got to be a genuine commitment to listening and to act on what we hear as well. Young people need to feel valued and they're very sensitive to picking up when they're not. And so we need to show them through the process that we're genuine about our in, in, intentions and also the limitations of what we can do. And we need to, as with all engagement, continue to showcase the value of conversations and engagement and the practical change they can lead to, to ensure those making decisions don't see it as a nice to have, um, speaking to our community, speaking with young people, but as essential for good design. And with all underrepresented voices and unheard voices, we need to make sure as, as people working in the sector that we really push that door open and because they're not always in the position to do that themselves. So that's me, that's my sort of take on it um, and insight. Um, but now I'm going to hand you over to our speakers. So first up, we've got Susanna Walker. And Susanna is going to be highlighting her work and research at Make Space for Girls, which is a brilliant charity campaign of parks and public spaces. And designing those with teenage girls in mind has been some really great um, feedback from the work they've been doing, some real parallels with some of our findings for young, young girls. So it's brilliant to read that, really, really important. Maria is going to be second, and she's going to bring an international perspective from her experience as a leading urban policymaker in Vienna. Um, and they're creating neighbourhoods for children that work for all people, which 
I think again relates to my point above that by working and thinking about children actually we're thinking about a much broader sense of the population so that would be really really interesting and also effective citizen engagement involvement in the decision making process I'm really really interested to hear about that and finally Shanks is going to be looking at her talking about her experience and Shanks is very much focused on traditional challenge and traditional approaches to architecture head-on and focusing on community-led sustainable design processes so it's going to be really really exciting really interesting range of voices so first off I'm going to hand over to Susanna and I will unmute myself thank you very much I'm really pleased to be here really looking forward to hear what everyone has to say as well but we're moving fast so without any further ado have a slide um this is really where we began. Right when we were setting up Make Space for Girls, I we were trying to work out whether this was a good idea or not. And I was just talking to every teenage girl I met. And this was my friend's daughter. And I asked her, well, you know, do you go to the park? What do you do? And she just gave me the 14-year-old thousand-yard stare and said, why would I go to the park? There's nothing there for me. And that's what Make Space for Girls is all about. At the moment, parks and public spaces do not provide anything for teenage girls. And um, we're there to try and change that. So this is what we're aiming for. We want parks and all public spaces, meanwhile spaces, you know, other bits of the urban realm that are kicking around, any public space to be designed with teenage girls in mind. So they're spaces where they can be active, where they can be social, or they can just sit quietly and read a book but that there are spaces that they feel comfortable in. Um, there's so much I could say about this. So this is very much a whistle-stop tour, tour through um, why we exist, what we're doing, how we talk to teenage girls. Really always happy to talk to people more at greater length about almost anything. So what are we here to do? At the moment, parks and public spaces do not work for teenage girls. And there's a really simple reason for this. Whenever we provide anything, quote, for teenagers, unquote, it is almost always dominated by teenage boys. The skate park, the mooga, the fence pitch, the basketball court, the BMX track. Now, all of these end up, for a whole lot of different reasons, being dominated by boys. But what we say we need to do is fix the facilities not fix the girls. It's really easy to go, oh, we've got a skate park, so let's teach the girls to skate park, skateboard. We're like, no, should we just step back a bit? Let's talk to the girls, find out what they want, find out what the problems are, and then decide what we're going to do. We do this for a whole host of reasons. I mean, there's just a basic rights issue. You know, why shouldn't girls be entitled to public space? And to turn this on its head, at the moment, what public space says to girls is, you don't belong here, you should be at home. I can't really get behind. But there's also some really important health statistics. Teenage girls are more likely to be um, inactive at every stage of their teenage life than teenage boys. But we never connect this up with the fact that we don't give them anything to be active on. Um, seems reasonable enough. Mental health also is probably almost even more of an imperative. It's really clear evidence now that. Um, Mental health, a good, good mental health is linked to access to green space. So in a world where teenage girls are three times more likely than teenage boys to have a mood disorder, it kind of stands to reason that we need to do something about this. There's also the law. I'm going to this. Teenagers, all teenagers have a right to play up to the age of 18 under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. We endlessly stick notices on playgrounds saying no over 12. We need to get over ourselves on this. Specifically, the Equality Act and its provision of the public sector equality duty says that all public bodies, which means councils, amongst many others, have a duty not just to consider equality in their decision making, but to act to redress discrimination. So we've got a problem. They need to sort it out. In short, um, I, they, I could say I could literally speak for half an hour on all of those things, but we're focusing today on what's teenage girls want um, and they they're very clear about this they want a space that's theirs the good the, the one good thing that 
Moogas and skate parks do really well is they tell teenage boys that it's okay to be there. Nobody is ever going to clear a teenage boy away for loitering on a skate park. They act as permissions. So we need to create stuff for teenage girls that give them that same permission to take up space outdoors. Um, to be hidden but seen sounds really weird, but they want to feel safe. So they want to be in areas with lots of people, but they don't want to be stared at. Um, and that's really that's really important. They want to play. They want play spaces. So much of what we provide for teenagers is really didactic. Play football here, skateboard here. They want to muck around and just play, but not to be on the little kids stuff because they're, they're on the little kids stuff. The mums of the little kids tot at them and tell them off and nobody comes out of it feeling very good. And if there's one thing that I think is most crucial, it's about having many areas. If you have one space, and this is part of the story about why boys dominate spaces, it will get taken up, taken over by the most dominant group. Spoiler alert, that is not often teenage girls. So the more spaces you provide, the more different groups can occupy the space at the same time. Um, and this doesn't just benefit girls. It benefits the boys who don't want to play on the Mooga, who don't feel they're part of the dominant group. It benefits LGBTQA plus teenagers. You know, it just makes spaces better. So, sorry, I'm dealing with. So the good news is in the couple of years since we've been going, more and more people have been talking to teenage girls, but also to teenagers. So women in sport and Yorkshire sport surveyed over 400 teenagers across three schools in Yorkshire. And this tells us two things. One, it tells us what girls want. They want swings. Boy, do they want swings really badly. What this doesn't say is they also want social seating, social seating where they can face each other when they're talking. Um, but this was a question about being active. Trampolines, play equipment. They don't really want skate parks. They definitely don't want moogers. But also boys don't really want them either. We've just kept putting the stuff in without going, actually, how well is this working? Is this what teenagers want? So we do a lot of consultation with teenage girls. Um, as has <laughs> already been said, they're brilliant. They really know their stuff. You don't, if you can get them going, they will tell you all about where they live in really granular detail. But it's difficult for girls for a lot of reasons. They just don't see public spaces being for them. So you can't just go, what do you want? Because they'll look at you and go, well, I don't know, never had it. So it takes some work to get them to think about space. Um, Julia King, we've been doing some work with Julia King from the LSE, who's been creating curriculums for sort of researchers in residence, where the girls are paid by the LSE to follow a curriculum all about architecture and the design of spaces and feminism and public space, with the idea that they can then map their own areas that they can make interventions creatively with the knowledge to do this. Um, but even with an all, you know, just a very short consultation, with doing the work, with getting to think about public space, how they want it to make them feel, you can persuade them to open up and talk about it. Again, another half an hour really easily. So what I was going to do very quickly is just whiz through some great projects from abroad really speedily. Um, which have all been done in consultation with teenage girls. Malmo, long story, don't have time for it. Really nice. But they're basically making small play areas for teenagers in unused corners of the urban realm. They built 12, they built 14, realised they built 12 skate parks. They're all full of boys. Next one, the girls designed it. It's got a stage. You can't see it. It's a really weird shaped park. You can't photograph it properly. It's got gym exercise bars. Really cheap, simple solution. Used to be in lots of parks, not there anymore. Girls love them. It's got a climbing wall. It's divided into different areas. What's fascinating is that the, getting the girls to design it exclusively was what it took to create a park that was used 50-50 boys and girls, which you know just shows how much the dominance of boys is and how much work we have to put in to, just to create equality. No, that's the wrong mouse, sorry. Um, this is a lovely simple solution. Again, designed with teenage girls in Sweden, space of a Mooga, much more playful, much more creative. The thing I like about this most is actually the shelter. Because the British thing of just dumping a shelter in the middle of some grass, again, territorializable space, going to get taken over by the most dominant group. It's integrated. It's part of the play. It's covering the seating you could use as a stage. You can do other stuff with. There's different areas of seating under the shelter. It's just so much better, <laughs> in short, and entirely designed by, for, and with teenage girls. 
um, also in Sweden. Um, EMEA are really interesting. They have a they have sort of taken the Vienna idea of gender mainstreaming it and, and, and bleh, of gender mainstreaming and applied it to their city. And they've done all sorts of interesting things. This is co-designed with an artist, with an architect by a group of teenage girls, ergonomically designed to fit to the bottom of a teenage girl. Great. But again, it works in the early evening. It's full of teenage girls. It's not taken over by other groups. Um, and it looks great. Um, Vienna, I am here too. But this is a lovely thing. Again, the teenage girls in the area wanted a stage. So it's a community asset. You can use it for other stuff. But they wanted a stage to perform in. But why I like this so much is it's labelled as the girls' stage. This goes back to what I was saying about permission. By, by that really simple act, they've ensured that the girls feel entitled to use it. And that is so important. I did, this, these are the aspirational swings of all time, but that's what this is one of the most popular images we show to teenage girls. And we get them to do collages about their ideal part. And this one comes up all the time as being a really, really popular thing. Big swings that go high, not basket swings, not communal things, a bank of swings that they can swing on. And when we put it on Twitter, actually loads of grown women go, and in fact, I don't care about teenage girls, please can I have these swings? So, or this is in Superkillen in Copenhagen, um, social seating and swings. I'm queuing for this. I took this picture, I'm queuing for this. It's five degrees, it's full of girls and women. It was brilliant. So, oh, I've fallen off the edge. I'm not gonna say that. Um, so that's a really, really, really quick run through of um, every, <laughs> of just a very few quick highlights of what can happen, interesting things that can happen when you talk well to teenage girls. And I'll hand you back to Jo. Thank you very much. I was very, really interesting. Um, I love some of those examples. Um, I would be keen for the swings too, and I can imagine why they're popular. Um, I'll come back with questions perhaps after we've heard from Maria as well, if that's okay. And we can we can come with questions on both, but it was really, really interesting and I've made quite a lot of notes that I'll follow up on in a moment. So Maria, shall I hand over to you? Thanks. Um, and right after Susanna's so highly inspirational presentation, I would like to take us to Vienna and <laughs> you will see in a minute that uh, we are connected, although we haven't spoken to each other ahead of the webinar. So um, I have tons of slides. I will rush us through and I'll get as far as I can and then, you know, just stop at some point. But there's so much I would like to share. So I claim that Vienna is a city for all. Um, and that it has invested in a way in design for all historically. Um, and you may have heard that um, Vienna is regularly ranked as the world's number one in terms of livability. So what I'm asked all the time is, you know, how do you do it in Vienna? And how come you have stayed at the top for so long? Um, so the first question I have to ask is, what is life quality? And what you can see here in the image may be giving us uh, an answer to that. Now, I think that life quality has a lot to do with what we all long for ourselves and what we long for our children, which is, by the way, why young couples always think that they have to leave the city as soon as they know that their first child is arriving, feeling like they have to buy a little cottage, um, somewhere in the suburbs so the child can have a happy childhood and what is a happy childhood it's a lot about um, growing up in a safe environment um, a green environment where you have access to nature where you can play with water perhaps um, and now look at this as soon as people are there besides you know cities growing like endless carpets of little houses this is where you spend the rest of your life, trying to bring the kids to school and trying to go to work and trying to do anything you need to do for everyday life. And this is what it does with the inside of our cities. And the image I'm showing, I'm sharing here with you is the inside of Vienna, right at the heart. So this is not a place where we have solved all, all problems. I'm just, just showing 
what it looks like within our cities. So we went, we said we want to go the other way around. Um, we want to provide all these qualities I've been talking about, access to nature, access to water, being able to move around freely and safely and play. What if we provided all this at the heart of our cities? What would our cities look like? So this is in the end, the threefold strategy of Vienna. It's about affordability. I'm not going to be going into this tonight because this is not our issue. It's about livability as I have just defined it. And it's about community. And let's say that the basic thing to say is that a good city for children is a good city for every generation and for all of us. So by the way, what you see here in this image is uh, an artificial lake, a new urban quarter in Vienna, affordable housing, so practically social housing in the backdrop. Um, and basically designing new urban quarters around the needs of young families and children and seeing what it does for all of us and for life quality uh, within the city. So to make a long story short, um, it's about using new urban quarters as an opportunity. What I will be showing to you is the, the, the piece of, of, of land, let's put it this way, the, the small new urban quarter where the yellow arrow is pointing at. And what you can see uh, adjoining it is a vast former railway area, which is right now being constructed into a new piece of city that I cannot show you because this is a construction site, basically. But in a year or so, I could, I could show you what it looks like in real life. Now, Vienna draws from 100 years tradition of social housing and predominantly municipal housing, public housing, as we call it. And I have chosen this picture just to show you that it already 100 years back, it was about what I'm talking about today. So it's about water, playing with water. This used to be bathing basins for children. It's about providing everything you, you need for everyday life for children, like kindergartens and schools and playgrounds within these municipal buildings and children walking safely and being able to play. Um, and enjoy outdoor life uh, and interact, of course, with each other. So this is what it looked like historically. So left hand, you have an image from the 30s. Right hand, you have an image from 10 years ago. Uh, and it's just to show how this is translated in today. And this is what it looks like. Social housing, subsidized housing in Vienna, we keep creating 7,000 subsidized units per year, but it's not about the units, it's about the pieces of city that are created around the subsidized housing. And again, you can see here, being able to move around freely, to play, providing green spaces, providing safe spaces, um, just doing anything it takes so that children can move around freely and safely and enjoy outdoor life. Now, this is what it looks like in terms of master plan. This is just an example of uh, a master plan around the new railway station um, in Vienna. What is important about it is this seven hectare green space that you can see in the middle, high density at the edges, predominantly subsidized housing, and uh, by the way, a multi-generation school campus opening at the park so that children can walk to school um, safely and play after school immediately um, afterwards. This is what it looks like in real life today that it's been built. And what is extremely important and I love these two images because look at this and look at that. No gated communities, no high traffic streets in between, but more so green 
vast green accessible spaces, accessible 24 seven, allowing for diverse uses. And again, a vast green space in the middle, high density at the edges and focus on walking and cycling on the surface, collective garages at the edges, um, and then focusing on outdoor life and whatever we need to feel happy ourselves and our children uh, on the surface, again, uh, at the heart of these green spaces. This is just to show you that water is still a very important element that is introduced everywhere. So children can swim, can play with water, can experiment with water in everyday life. And um, this is just an example of the school, the multi-generation school campuses that are being introduced. Um, this is done by architect Martin Kohlbauer in Vienna. Uh, and it's just an example of the way this is being done, always open up, opening up onto the, um, again, vast green spaces so that children can walk to school. Important, uh, children are pretty much as their, are, as their uh, parents um, involved in, in the planning processes. So what you can see here is a mobile um, unit where um, families can be involved into their ideas of what it needs to design new urban quarters. And what you see in the backdrop, this Lego table is actually not thought for children to play for. It's about children and the parents learning to experiment with mass and space and um, learning how to uh, design areas that will perhaps mean higher density at the edges, but will give us spaces for life. So to make a long story short, this is what it looks like. Um, we have, while designing the adjoining area that I've been pointing out at before, um, we involved and invited uh, communities living in the adjoining areas to participate. We had uh, an open ideas competition and, and a cooperative planning process. We've had more than 100 ideas submitted. Um, and what you can see here is the result. So we have had a few thousand people all together participating and actually saying that they would like to have a wild park at the heart uh, of the area. And again, they don't fear high density at, at the edges. Here you can see another rendering of what is being actually created right now, which leads me to what I think is the most important issue. And that is when it comes to designing cities for children and, and young adults to think of connected places, to think, uh, of, of, to think in the categories of networks, to realize that it's not about metropolitan centers, that it is about creating centers even at neighborhood level and connecting them with each other with walkable um, boulevards, with green boulevards, example given within five minutes, with cycling networks when it comes to 10 to 15 minutes, and then again with public transport when it comes to connecting metropolitan centers uh, with each other. So this is just an example to show you what it looks like in real life. So at the left, we have the area that is being designed right now. In the middle, we have a new urban quarter that is to be built within the next years until 2030. And then we have a historical huge park, which you see to the right, our garden in Vienna. And the idea is to connect all of them with other existing smaller and larger parks and squares and schools and in cultural institutions. So everything you need for everyday life with highly walkable and green boulevards, thus creating walkable, um, child-friendly spaces for everyday life and a network where you can enter it uh, wherever you are in Vienna within 
maximum 300 meters from any spot uh, within the city. And then you can walk for hours and hours and it's, it's shaded, it's green and it's safe. That's the basic idea. So that's an example of how this is being actually planned. Now, that means transforming the already built city, so transforming historical neighborhoods, which means realizing that you have to rethink the street and transform it into places for life, which then means that you have to make room for public space, take the cars out and transform streets and create again the network that I've been talking about involving former car streets that are being now turned into pedestrian zones, shared spaces, etc. So the basics is when we're talking about child-friendly and, and youth-friendly city, it's about optimizing traffic for children, which means introducing a speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour maximum throughout the entire city and optimizing traffic lights, etc. And then it's about pedestrianizing. But it's not just about taking out cars. It's about creating spaces and places for life, which we did, example, given one of Vienna's longest shopping streets, by inviting people from the entire vicinity to participate, regardless of age. You can see that it was done openly on the streets. Um, and what we also did was to introduce something that I cannot, of course, go into right now. It's called the, the functional social spatial analysis, where you um, actually observe how space has been used before by different groups, especially by youth. Uh, and of course, you look into the way girls use it, the way boys use it. You do interviews. Um, and you try to redesign space in a way that will not um, create an anywhere place where, you know, groups that have been using it before are more or less pushed away. But you actually look into what they say that they appreciate, look into their needs and then design space around it. Now, to make also, again, a long story short, this is what it looked like 2013, Vienna's longest shopping street. This is what it looks like today. And what's even more important is we introduced child play elements along the way. So this is just an example of what was said, water tables where children can, can play with it. I think yeah, I'm yeah. running out. Yes, I'm Sorry. running. Out I don't want to interrupt, but <laughs> I'm conscious no, no, no. of that's of that's me. exactly where I wanted to stop. And this is where I will connect with Susanna. I'll show you just another two um, um, images, and then I'm done. Now, what Susanna has been talking about in Vienna is the gender sensible design of of public space, especially with regard to youth and girls. So this is exactly what Susanna has been showing before. This is an, a park in Vienna that has been redesigned, asking girls about their needs. Um, and it's just a coincidence, a lovely coincidence that we, we're talking about exactly the same project today without having talked to each other before. So they were asked together with women to talk about their needs. So there has been... Uh, a participatory process that went on for a couple of months and it led to awesome results in terms of creating public space um, around you know the needs of of of, of young girls of, of boys of women and men um I will leave it at that I just I just I just wanted um to make a long story short again and to wrap it up I think that, um, creating places again for children and for youth has a lot to do with looking into the needs, listening to them, working together with them, participatory design, enabling them to be part of it. And then again, never losing the big picture of wanting to be a city that's good for young children, 
for young families, for youth, because a city that's good for these is a good is a good city for us all. And thanks. Thank you so much. That was very inspiring. And I could quite happily continue to listen to, to all of the rest of the slides. Um, and I was just thinking how I'm going to show that presentation to one of our clients who are looking at creating new neighbourhoods, which are family centred and, and very much some of those principles that you have been talking about. So I guess just I, given your presentation, Maria, showed some case studies and a, and a whole holistic approach that I imagine many of us in this room are sitting there thinking that's what we would like to see what do you think is the I guess what advice would you offer to enable us to to learn and deliver some of those um principles in in our country which perhaps isn't quite as embracing of engagement and uh all-encompassing holistic conversations and co-design so does the question go to me or to Susanna? Yeah, to you and then perhaps Susanna as well, if you'd like to come in on that. I think that I would say something that Susanna said in the beginning as well. I think that it's a lot about looking into how different groups use public space, um, especially the difference between girls and boys, different ages. And then realizing that it's not about creating just big spaces that look the same, but differentiating and creating sub rooms where different groups can use it. Um, and I'll pass it on to Susanna, but just to say one last thing, I think you can create spaces in different ways that will encourage interaction or just peaceful coexistence, example given. It has a lot to do with how much space you have and what you are at in terms of community building. Thank you. Susanna? Oh, I think you're on mute, Susanna. So they're all classic. I, think... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say those words. <laughs> um, I think for us, the single biggest thing is raising awareness. Almost nobody has done this deliberately. It's not like people have set out to design girls and women out of spaces. It's just, it's what Caroline Corrado Perez calls the default male. Um, and as soon as people see it, they can't unsee it and they want to do something about it. So I think in the UK, the number one task is just to get people thinking with that mindset, talking about it, sharing the ideas, and then that's what's going to start changing things really quickly and looking at all the great things that have been done in places like Vienna so that we can prove to them that, it, that it's not expensive or difficult. Brilliant. And why do you, why do you think it is? I mean, this might be a silly question. Um, why do you think girls have been so excluded from spaces or through the design? What do you think is the reason for that? Um, I think that I think people are still quite pleased they thought of teenagers at all. And so they just haven't looked at it. I think um, not seeing it, having no data at all. There are thousands of Moogas across the country. There is literally there's one research paper on Moogas, which is about doing social work in them, brackets with boys. Mm. It, well, how we can do anything and keep doing it without actually looking for some evidence on whether this works or not just boggles me beyond all belief. So gathering data, I think, is not having the data is part of it. Um, oh, God, there's so, many, there's so many answers to this question. I think, it, you know, it's got a big historical background to the idea that women belong at home and that public space is for men. And the example I, I give for this when everyone goes, no, 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 that when in Victorian times, when they proposed public toilets for women, there were active campaigns against it on the grounds that women would leave their homes and start gallivanting around and generally, quote unquote, be immoral. So the pressure, you know, public space is not seen as something that women are supposed to do. You know, and there's this huge cultural background to it. But as somebody said, I can't remember who said, but to be in public space is to be part of the community, you know, to be part of the body politics. So it's really important that women and girls are part of it, you know, quite apart from all the health stuff. There's a, you know, a fundamental rights issue here. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much. Um, um, I completely agree to all of that. I'm just conscious that Shanks has now joined yeah. us, I think from a taxi, which is a new level of commitment to joining a panel. <laughs> um, so I'm going to quickly bring Shanks in, um, just in case any uh, connection issues happen. So uh, Maria and Susanna will come back with some more questions um, from the audience as well in a moment. But for now, Shanks, um, I believe so is going to do the technology and share your presentation, um, if that's okay. Yes. I don't know if you can see that, Shanks, but we will, we, you're on. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry. I'm just doing ROBA tours around the country. So uh, uh, we're in a taxi at the moment. Um, yeah, so my company's called Nudge, um, based in Bristol, and um, do a lot of work for the last 15 years with uh, master's students in architecture and uh, Design West in Bristol, running a programme called Shape My City for young people um, between 15 to 18 years of age from diverse backgrounds. So we do a lot of work um, trying to encourage young people to look at public space differently and to engage them in really understanding what good design is around us. Um, if you could do the next slide. So um, something, yeah, something that we always think about and should be thinking about is that between the ages of zero to five, humans learn more than they do for the rest of their life. And we should be designing spaces for everyone. And if we can design really wonderful spaces for toddlers, then they're safe enough for everyone else around us too. And so that's something that we should be doing from the very start of any sort of design process is thinking about toddlers because then it really is comfortable and safe for everyone. Next slide. Um, so this is Design West, which is the programme we run from Bristol and have run for 10 years now. Um, and it's called Shape My City. And we work on a whole, we work with partner organisations across the Southwest, looking at um, way, getting, well, encouraging young people to not just think that it's architecture, but it's also engineering, it's sustainability design, it's um, conservation architecture, landscape architecture. So they really get a sense of all the different fields that you could be thinking about within our built environment. Next slide. And this is actually the workshop we did last week, which was looking at bridge design. So getting them to really think about minimizing the amount of materials that you're going to use and how much more sustainable projects could be if you're thinking about um, the minimal amounts of materials that you can use and that includes sort of thinking about not demolishing existing buildings around us and our heritage next slide um yeah and part of lecturing one of the things we have been doing is looking at the extra large scale so really thinking about policy change as well and the impact that has so from the really extra large scale what can we be doing to think about reducing um, uh, cars on the roads we know that 80 percent of our public space is actually roads so how do we start to reduce the amount of cars that are coming into cities and get more people on bikes and other forms of transport and through delivery and then thinking more recently we were thinking about flooding and um, ecology and net zero, um, biodiverse net zero gains and stuff. So just getting them to really think from a really broad perspective, but from that extra large to the extra small scale. Next slide. Um, we recently visited Copenhagen and it made me really realise that play can happen at such different um, scales and and actually getting adults to be able to have environments in which they can play as much as young people will encourage young people as they grow up to want to play more as well and I think you know all of our public space all of our environments should be as playful as possible next slide next last um, and this was kind of one of our public space projects in Bristol where we worked with young people thinking about sort of colors and spaces and making sure that even sort of the furniture would allow for wheelchair making it wheelchair accessible and engaging them during lockdown and COVID to think about food as a way of um, encouraging them between to think about between green spaces, how um, young people could interact and make those public space, use the public spaces more than they do the roads. Next slide. So 
seven, right, that might have been the last one. I can't see any more on. Hi, Shanks, it's Sarah. Yeah, I think that was the last one. Oh, great, okay. Okay. <laughs> Jack, so, is there yeah, anything I, else you wanted to say, though, that might not have a slide? If you want to add anything else, though? Um, no, I think that, that was it. It was just basically we, we kind of it's so important to work from re really young age um, with young people. We're trying to do a community pool at the moment as well in Bristol. And so we're going into all the schools. So we're working our way around all the um, primary schools and secondary schools to get them to find out really how they want that space to be. Thank Amazing. you. Thank you. I love the commitment. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm conscious that on the Q&A, there's quite a few questions that Susanna is, is doing an excellent job of responding to in the uh, Q&A at the bottom. Um, so for now, I'm going to put them to the side. I think Victoria might have a question which she would like to bring in, and then I'll keep scanning those Q&As to make sure there's anything that hasn't been responded to. Hi, thanks. Um, yes, I think we've all heard and seen these kind of um, activities going on and can't quite understand why it isn't just become the norm. I mean, I often keep saying it, everything's a must have, not a nice to have. And yet we're still going through that experience. I just put in the chat room one more of a query, knowing from experience, when we've worked with uh, young people, girls they have tended to think about the space for everybody so you will go into generation they won't just think about themselves but i haven't really i don't really remember that happening with boys and i was just asking wondering whether anybody had an experience where they find the boys are engaging or coming back to susanna's or kind of um our kind of history of how females think about uh, their place um, that is usually uh, caring about others a lot of the time is that one of the reasons why we we don't find boys so engaged about other people within that space are thinking more about themselves <clears throat> but maybe that's a bit being a bit hard on them as well you know we actually did um a piece of work with the Hasseltine Institute a research piece and we split our academy group for one of the workshops into boys and girls so there was four groups of girls, four groups of boys, and challenged them to design the same space. The girls used lots of words like community and inclusive and created spaces for lots of different people um, and really thought about it very holistically. Uh, the boys focused on car, cars, car parking, knocking down buildings to put more cars in. And they also thought about it very as a series of individuals working as part of a team, whereas the girls thought about a team. So the, the, and the, the kind of the words that they used, we did an al analysis of the words they used, very, very different. So everything about the process for the same site, the outcomes were completely different and the process that they took um, to an extent that we were really surprised because we, we thought maybe that was a stereotype. But no, as a, as a piece of work with the university, it was quite a stark difference, so really insightful. I don't know if anyone else has similar experience. <laughs> It's not quite that, but there's I th one of the things that we've realised is that both boys and girls learn one of the key ways where they learn their experience of space is in primary school, where the boys take up most of the area of the playground to play football, and the girls are forced to just find the spaces left in around the edges. And um, there are some really good organisations actually working to change this. We don't do this because. Outdoor play and learning, can't recommend them too highly, but really good at creating just a more playful culture in school playgrounds. But but so, and because of the associations of football and masculinity, this is all getting quite theoretical, but taking up space becomes part of what it is to be a boy and mm. what it is to be male. So there's all, and there's this, um, there's a really brilliant bit of research, although it's incredibly depressing on how football was run in a couple of primary schools in London in which the boys were absolutely privileged and the teachers were giving the same message to the girls that, you know, that space and football was not for them. Because even if, if girls try to join in, 
the boy, the, you know, they endlessly report that the boys won't pass them. They're not, you know, they're they're just not permitted to play. Never mind the whole the message that everyone's getting about who matters in space. So I think this is something that you know we need to look at fixing, kind of first thing, before we can address any of the wider things about why they're making different choices later on. Thank you. And Shanks, do you want to come in at that point as well? Yeah, um, I think what I think what's really interesting about what you're saying there is that um, there's a book called How How to Raise Boys and How to Raise Girls, which looks at the psychology of um, girls and boys and how differently they work and think. And um, boys are, you know, in many often seen as being like a year and a half behind girls, but also simultaneously when we're looking at um, when you look at public space like parks, very often many more facilities are provided for boys and men than they are provided for women and girls. And that's something that we're kind of really pushing for with like a public swimming pool, you know, and how swimming is something, especially during lockdown, so many more women are doing that. It's great for menopause, like girls generally love outdoor swimming much more. I mean, it should be a space for everybody, but we are finding that we're sort of studying lots of parks across the city and the facilities are much more geared towards um boys than they are girls yeah definitely it's, it's really interesting because on the chat I can see that Richard in particular is saying that they, they've kind of done a lot of work with boys who actually at primary level are perhaps thinking a lot more holistically and thinking about grandparents and older people without any any prompts which I wonder if it's an age I wonder if it kicks in at a certain age or um and if that's anything to do with our environments but it'd be very well, interesting to know if you <laughs> If you ask boys at primary school whether they want their football taken away, they get very, very annoyed, though. I think it's more hypothetical. But to, just to add to this thing about parks, that was something I didn't have a chance to mention, but pitches. We're, acres and acres of parks are covered in pitches. And everyone goes, oh, well, but, you know, it's getting better. What about the lionesses? Now, what's fascinating about pitches is we do have the data because Sport England really encourages council to produce a thing called a playing pitch strategy. Joyously, those some of those have the teams for football separated by gender. So I can tell you that most playing pitches are used between 93 and 95 percent by men and boys. So all of this space is basically manspreading. Um, we're doing some work with a group of girls in Oxford at the moment and their local park. It's not a park. It's just a flat area of green that is predominantly pitches. It's got a small fence play area, it's got a basketball court, and the girls have a really uncomfortable metal seat that when, which enables them to watch boys playing basketball. That's what not having access to space looks like. Mm -hmm. But I think we really need to start asking questions about pitches and what, you know, we've, we've basically recreated the primary school playground a thousand times over in parts. But the other thing is girls say they want nature. And that park like that is offering you no nature at all, just green desert. Absolutely. Um, I'm very conscious of time. We have two minutes um, before we need to, to sign off. So, Maria, do you have a quick final point that you'd like to make? Maria. Yeah. I just noticed your hand was up. Actually, I only wanted to, to comment on what Susanna said, that it's exactly corresponding to, 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 to Vienna's experience because you have boys... Uh, out there all the time for ages and ages now, predominantly also because housing units are so small, right? So they need to spend time outdoors in many cases, which led to parks being designed around basketball uh, pitches and football pitches. And we call them cages, by the way, because you have heavy traffic streets, okay, on both sides. And then leftover spaces where you have a few benches where girls might be sitting and this is why this is why we actually went out to girls asking them what it is that they need you know and redesigning uh space around this so uh, it's it's pretty much the same experience as, as what Susanna has been talking about 
Thank you. Um, amazing how many similarities and common themes there are, and many of the same pictures as well in all three presentations. So it's uh, really, really informative and great to see those that that learning that's there and available to share. Um, I'm going to hand over to Victoria now, but thank you all speakers for, for being great panellists to, to engage with for the last hour. So thank you very much. It was brilliant. Uh, I just wanted to kind of thank everybody. Um, sorry, Ali, we couldn't get her video up. She did do a presentation. So uh, we're just going to put that on online um, once we finish this. Um, so it was difficult to try and put it up during because of things, but I'm just putting it in the chat um, room to actually give you our channel, which has all our other videos of previous webinars as well. Um, Hi, I'm Sarah Alley and I'm team leader of Landscape Design and Conservation. The team sits within the Council's Planning, Transportation and Highways Department, and we are constantly championing the quality of public realm in our urban environment and working with the local plan team to develop planning policy that will ensure that all new development has easy access to public spaces and that we create the right conditions for young people to enjoy public spaces. Bradford is a great northern city with a population of over half a million. The district is almost two thirds rural with a large urban centre and smaller market towns and villages set within the landscape of the southern Pennine Hills. It's a beautiful place with a stunning architectural heritage, home to enterprising and creative people and strong and productive businesses. Our ambition is to create a healthy city, an environment where our young people have quality spaces, an environment that's a great place to live and play so that they can grow to have better lives, better health and better skills. We're putting our people and in particular our children at the heart of this work and we will achieve this by using innovative design, delivery and policy, as well as working collaboratively and building capacity to ensure that the community and stakeholders are able to help shape, shape it. A bottom-up approach that starts and ends with our communities. It's also an opportunity for communities to give something back and more importantly, to build a lifelong relationship with the outdoor spaces. With a population of just over half a million, almost a quarter of which is under 16, Bradford is the youngest city in the UK. Our urban population is diverse, with one in four people identifying as British of Asian origin. The city has high levels of deprivation, which are concentrated in our urban neighbourhoods, where most of our BAME communities live. Almost 40% of 10 to 11 year olds are obese. Only 40% of children and young people are physically active. And in the summer, families use outdoor spaces on average six hours a week, and in winter, one and a half hours a week. However, Asian families spend less than half the amount of time as their British counterparts. On average, people in Bradford live eight years less than in their neighbouring greener towns like Harrogate. So we need to make changes and act early by altering behaviour and spaces so that our children have the same opportunities as neighbouring greener towns and cities. We are working with partners to help us improve our public spaces. The link between green spaces and health is well established. And in Bradford, we've been focusing our work on health and using that as a driver for change. The impact of urban space is much stronger within more deprived groups, indicating that interventions which aim to improve quality or use of green space in more deprived areas will help reduce health inequalities. This slide shows the active Bradford network and the number of key programmes we are working with, including JOMP, Well Bradford, Streets of People, Low Traffic Neighbourhood, Play Streets, School Streets and Better Place Bradford, to generate projects that have been invaluable in linking spaces to young people. This work is a whole system neighbourhood approach to not only increase the level of physical activity in our young children and their families, but to get them to spend more time outside. So as well as investing in redeveloping local spaces, we're investing a considerable amount of resource in bringing about behavioural change 
that will ensure long-lasting and sustainable impact. We very much want our young people to feel like valued members of our community, for their voices to be heard, and we want to involve them in a meaningful way. So one of the ways we're doing this is in developing plans that mean they are at the centre of change for the city over the next few years. We know that creating a place that works for children is a good place for everyone. So we're thinking about them and their future and putting them at the centre of our regeneration work. Working with partners like Jump and Better Place Bradford, we've been able to scope out underused sites and those that have potential or mean something to our young people and create and improve spaces that are inclusive and welcoming. And we've made access improvements with paths that are a little bit more imaginative, linking routes and green spaces to promote active play and travel and encourage everyone to scoot, cycle or walk more. In particular, working with groups of young girls to make sure they are being consulted and that they are designing spaces that meet their needs. We're involving the local community in projects much earlier and trying to sustain their involvement for longer, going beyond the project design and construction to foster ownership of spaces. We're working on how best to get them involved by understanding the issues that matter to them and looking ahead at how the spaces will be used. We're also looking at how we involve them in the design and strategy and national health and infrastructure policies that relate to local challenges and how we can work with them to deliver quality spaces. It's very much a local spaces for local people. We're developing an integrated approach which delivers high quality urban design and utilises more nature-based solutions. We're bringing together more partners to not only create spaces but incorporate climate change adaptation, biodiversity, habitat creation and linking it to other projects and strategies across the city and wider district creating a series of stepping stones of urban spaces. By co-creating and co-producing green spaces and public realm designs, we ensure that input from all areas of the community contributes to the final design and build of spaces. This is done through several different methods involving local schools, mosques, churches and madrasas. We also adopt a multi-agency approach by working with organisations that are already engaging with our target audiences, linking into community events to better engage. Throughout the work, we ensure our young people's voice is heard and have opportunities to contribute and shape future plans throughout the process. Informal, less structured approaches are often a better way to involve young people. For example, activities or programmes that are based around interests or hobbies learning skills or simply having fun by incorporating art and music, sports and games, and drawing on useful talent like gardening and cooking. Some of the programmes that are run from Activation are in partnership with organisations such as Play Bradford, who are commissioned to activate spaces when they've been built. So what do young people need in design of the public realm to explore their city with confidence? Well, ultimately, it's the COMBI model for behavioural change. This cites capability, opportunity and motivation as three key factors capable of changing behaviour. In order to encourage a particular behaviour, a person must feel they are both psychologically and physically able to do so, have the social and physical opportunity and want to do it more than other compelling behaviours. Bringing young people's views into decision making is done through co-design co-creation and involving them in the projects earlier and sustaining their involvement for longer and by building confidence and upskilling and creating ownership and empowering them and giving them opportunities to contribute throughout the projects. It's also about building resilience in the community from a very young age and regular engagement to allow dialogue and contributions. Together, we're not only regenerating physical spaces, but we're trying to regenerate local people. It's not just about increasing opportunities, but also working on the cap capability and motivation of people. 
And finally, our all systems approach is also reflected by involving our colleagues within the council and colleagues in public health, neighbourhoods, maintenance team, our highway engineers, so that we can all deliver greater benefits with the resources that are available. Thank you. So thank you all, Maria, Susanna, Shanks, Joe, uh, for um, this evening. Um, and we hope that we can continue these. We have one on the 6th, 3rd of April, looking at steaming ahead. So it's really about education, um, how you bring architecture into that education framework. Um, and also, of course, we do have our awards, the Inspire Future Generation Awards, um, coming up in uh, the early autumn, and we have our Architecture into Education, which is school awards for school teachers to encourage them to use the built environment as part of their education process, uh, which we know is very difficult when creativity is being uh, pushed out of our uh, curriculum anyway. So again, thanks for everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing you um, properly sometime soon as well, not just online, Maria, maybe, hopefully sometime in not too distant future. Um, and But do leave, um, keep chatting online, use our um, um, channels for that. Um, and we look forward to seeing you uh, sometime again in the very distant future. So thanks very much, everybody. And thank you all.